Hi, welcome to Just Another Army Vet 2.0, where I make all Indian content. For those of you who are new, I'm Kylie. I'm a former combat medic for the U.S. Army. I have another channel called Just Another Army Vet, where I make all military and defense videos. Today's video comes from the channel Charudata Galande, and it is Colonel Lalit Ray, BRC of the Indian Army, and these are his cargo war stories. This is part three and the final part of my reaction. The first two parts are going to be linked in the description box below. Let's get to it. Meanwhile, with 40 of the other Jawans, I went up, rushed up. Uh, this will give you a good idea of the place. Can you see this area? This is how we went here, like this, like this, like this. This complete area is occupied by the enemy. This is the watershed behind. So we went up like this and then moved up like this. Halabartov. Now, around this area I am now stuck. 300 to 400 meters short of it. With 40 boys just rushed up. Now as you keep getting closer and closer to the enemy, firing a weapon becomes that much more difficult. Because it's got a long barrel, you've got to align the whole thing into his uh, side and then fire at him. By the time you fire the next chapter on that side, again you got to align the whole weapon like that. It becomes very difficult and unwieldy. That's why you require the shorter type of barrels or a pistol to have a close quarter battle. But our boys feel even <coughs> better when they have to leave the rifle alone and take the cookery out, which they did. They just pulled the cookery out. I still remember here and that blood curdling call of Jai Mahakali, Ayo Bakali, still ranging, you know, reverberating on that mountains. And there was a glint of cookery in that moonlit night, I still remember, very, very vividly. And as we were moving up like this, I could see the Paki heads rolling down. Actually, the heads rolling down like this. Boys were just chopping them off. My boys were what? Five feet nothing. These chairs were put on six feet something. Boys are just chopping and chopping them off like maze, you know. When the Paki saw that the heads are being chopped, for them to eat even Jhatka is haram. You know, need cut with the shatka is haram for them. And he is saying, now leave around Jannat, I will go to Jainam but I am cut with the shatka like this. I don't even eat meat which is cut with shatka. And here I am being made shatka here. <laughs> when he saw that, they panicked. They actually panicked. And it was a sight to behold. Five feet, nothing Gurkha, with his kukri glinting in the moonlight, jumping up and chopping it, and these chaps running. It was like a, those small children playing, you know games and came and captured this area quickly but of course by that time we had got a lot of damage too my uh, i already got a bullet on my knee my uh, splinters on my this, uh, ankle and above on the calf most of the guys got shot injured i could hear them screaming some of them screaming and most of them quiet whenever they Bullet was through and through, it was quiet. But when they were shattered, that was too painful. That is the time, only time when I heard them making noise, my voice. Otherwise, the threshold of pain is fantastic. They can take a lot of pain. And where people have a tough time even walking in high altitude, my chaps literally ran. That is the difference in between our troops and the normal ones. The Gurkhas or Gorkhas have a physiological advantage just because they were born at higher altitudes. So their blood is already kind of programmed to be able to operate with less oxygen. So what he says is very true. So, when we reached over here on top, I don't know how, there's a saying that Sar Me Kavan Baanke, that was a little thing because I had cut off my complete thought of the house, my family, my social, my friends, nothing. For me, there was just one thing, that is to reach the top somehow. Because the, the uh, problem or the crisis was, Suppose we had stuck on over here, and if you would have been stuck on there and the daylight would have come, these chairs would have from here, from here, from here, from here, picked us up like flies. We would have been butchered the next morning. Butchered is the word. It was, that was the crisis. It was do or die. I said, in any case we have to die, so why not die trying? And that was what I said, boys, get up. This is the thing. We have to do it now. It is now or never. If we go on top, the whole lot of us who are all stuck and injured over here are saved. If we don't, and if we deter and stay put over here to save our own lives for the time being, next morning we are dead in any case. 
So I collected these boys, 30, 40 of them, and we went and captured this area. Heads chopped. When I reached the top, I would have barely got a breath when a lot of fire started coming on us. And then I started counting the heads, how many people I've got with me. And to my horror, I had got most of the guys injured, eight people by the time we reached the top. We were just eight. And we were surrounded from this, this side, we had started the attack from this side. We are surrounded from this side. There's all enemy here. All along this side by enemy. And within an hour or so, there was a counter attack from the enemy. Because now they also started getting alarmed. They knew that we have already got a lodgement and a footing here. Manoj Pandey had got a footing here somewhere. It's called bunker area. And I have got a footing here on top. Now they realized, if we sit on top over here, not only do we cut off the supply route which is coming from the top like this here, supply and reinforcement, arms, ammunition, route for them, we also cut off the retreat. Should they have to retreat from here, from where will they go? They can't cross over here, they have mined areas and other people are there. They have to go this way. Now I am not only stopping the supply, I am also cutting off his retreat of his hopes. So it became imperative for him that he has to dislodge me from this area. By hook or by crook can the earliest. So within an hour we got the first counter attack. We beat it back. By that time we had enough ammunition. We had collected some ammunition from those dead parties also. Used their own weapons, killed them with them only. But after two attacks or so, it started becoming daylight and things became difficult. We started running low on ammunition. Third or fourth attack. I started getting a lot of calls on the radio set. Tiger 15, Tiger 15, message for you over, urgent message, Roy, urgent message for you over. I got very irritated because I was as it is managing this complete battle and also this complete front which I was looking after till there. Because action was happening around here also at that same time. Being the commanding officer, you're not only commanding this battle here which you're taking part yourself, you're commanding the complete area here like this. In any case, I was not required to move up with the troops as a commanding officer. I was supposed to sit out here somewhere and guide and tell them, yes, do this, do that. But like I told you, I had no choice. If I have to make a statement, I have to do it by leading from the front and leading by example. Other than this, no way. They don't even know me so well. Exactly. If I had known them right from the beginning, I was commissioned to the battalions, I know. I tell him, you'll do it. But tomorrow, someone just comes in and says, you do this, you're not going to do that, especially when it means your life. So, what he just said could not be any more true. As a leader, you lead from the front and you lead by example. He's the kind of leader who wants to actually be there with his men to get the mission done. He does not want to sit back and watch. I started getting bothered by someone on the radio set. I said, so and so, use the army language, I said, just lay off. Again, after 15, 20 seconds, so and so, one five, direct, I bust in message, urgent message over. Then it came five or six times, I said, there's something quite urgent about him. This fellow won't be pestering me like this, especially when he knows that after the battle I'm going to get him. He's not going to do this. So, I said, okay, Roy, pass your message over. Now, Roy was holding on to this area here. Kukur Thang was also held by the enemy. He was holding on to the area here. And from here, he could see everything clearly like this through the binoculars. Now, what Roy was trying to pass to me was, Yes, sir, you are there, eight of you, we are all watching you. And from here I can see these chairs forming up here and coming for the attack to you. And I can guide you as to where exactly they are coming from. That poor chair was trying to tell me that. I said, you idiot, why didn't you tell me earlier? He said, sir, I have been trying since half an hour. I said, okay, fine. So from here, then he started telling me, sir, from the big boulder area, now there are about 25 to 30 people who are coming up to you. So what I would do, these eight boys, I would align them towards that direction and all of them I would say keep quiet. When I say one, two, three, you all get up and then you fire towards that area. So the parties would come and I can hear them shouting and screaming. You know, the choices of languages. Kutte, ye karnenge, wo karnenge, Hindustani, ye hai, wo hai, sara kashumar bana denge, ye karnenge. I said, theek hai, hao. I also started giving a lot of gali, I said, hao, hao. So when they came, I would just get up there and fire at them and kill quite a few of them and then they would run back. This thing continued for about six or seven attacks, then they would come from this side. 
Again, he would tell me, sir, now they are coming from the north, from the top area. So I would align my head boys again this side. So this Pakistani, I am sure even now they are foxed as to how this guy did it. <laughs> if I write my book and memoir someday, that's why I will come and tell me, thank you for writing this. Other we were really forced to tell how you did it. <laughs> anyway, so we beat back about six to seven counter attacks like that. But then a situation came when uh, I was left with just two bullets myself, and my boys were also left with one or two bullets. And I could make out from their reaction as to, you know, they were very tensed up now. The cookies were there, but they were very tensed up. So they looked at me. I looked at them. And I was thinking to myself, I've got two bullets. One I've kept for myself. And one for the, at least I'll take one child before I go. Because the army colonel can't be captured by the enemy, especially a commanding officer. And the way these guys treat uh, prisoners, I mean, it's, it's terrible. And besides that, in any case, a commanding officer can't think of being captured. That will be a shame. So I said, one I will take for myself, that, that, that privilege and that uh, luxury I will have, to have a bullet for myself, and the other one is for this guy. And I was thinking, what do I do? You know, it sounds very simple, but imagine, you know, in the next 30 seconds, your life is hanging like that. In the next 30 seconds, you've got to go. Just imagine, put yourself into that shoe and see. In the next 30 seconds, I will be no more. It's a terrible thought. I'm telling you, it's a very unnerving sort of a situation. His mindset was completely correct. The last army in the world that you want to be captured by is the Pakistani army. As they heard the stories of what happened to that one LT in that patrol just a couple of weeks or the month prior. So I don't blame them. I have one bullet for the enemy and one for ourselves. So. I said no, I must make the situation slightly light. Otherwise uh, these types will get uh, uh, too tensed up. Let, they should, even if they have to die, they should die happy. So when he just uh, gave Gali, I said, I must think of something to make, you know, elevate this tension. That's why I say a sense of humor is very good for you all. Just like Field Marshal Sam Manikshaw said, as a leader, you cannot exhibit fear to your men. So he was, again, Haram Zalo, Hindustani Kutto, Karki, Kitkar, Nehye, Mujhe Malum Hai, Hame Malum Hai, Tumara Gola Malum Hai, Pura Khatam Ho Gya. So I also, having been trained in a good public school, and the Army Academy used the choicest. In this case, do we have any Sardar here? No. Do we have any Punjabi here? Okay, good. You'll be happy that I used your language maximum. <laughs> because Job Mazanata had Punjabi me Gali Dera, he can't be Punjabi. <laughs> so that fellow must have been quite sort of impressed by my vocabulary. But just to elevate the thing, I told my boys, you stupid chaps. You are commanding officer to your commanding officer to your gali de rai and commanding officer is alone to your gali de rai. Gali do! So as you know, our Gurkha Johnnies, they are very disciplined soldiers. But one thing they can't do is give gali. They don't know how to give gali. I am telling you, it's a very funny thing. But you ask any Nepali chat, he will not know how to give gali. Because we have gali hota hi nahi hai. So, now they were in door drops. Gali dena to aata nahi hai, but commanding officer ne hukum diya to that is pakka lakshman ka lakhim pa gata. Gali to dena hai hai, so he looked around and they nominated one chap. You are little extra smart, you are the chap will get gali. So I still remember that. The Pakistanis are coming closer and they are shouting. Ram Zado, ye hai, kutto, ye hai, ho hai. So this fellow gets him says, Pakistani kutta sala, idhar aega tera mundi gaar dega. So I told that chair, look, the parties will die, but they will die laughing because you can't even let him kill the gali. You are going to kill the gali, you can't even let him kill the gali. Anyway, that elevated their spirits to quite an extent. They started laughing at each other. They all know gali is not going to come. Then the Pakistanis came closer. Now from 40 yards, they started to come to 35 yards. And I don't know what to do. Situation is great. Then I remembered that sitting down with uh, my friend Roy here, is one Major Dhingra, who was an artillery officer, who was a battery commander attached to us. Now the system is, uh, infantry battalion has artillery officers attached to you. So when the fire is required, all he does is, passes on his radio set to guns which are placed far behind, 15 to 16 kilometers behind like this. He just gives them an 8 feet of grid reference, you know, map reference, and then he directs the fire with that, with the radio set. The only thing is that, 
The requirement is that that man who is directing the fire should be able to see the target, which Dhingra was. And Dhingra was known as the mad hatter because he had one very good pastime. His best pastime was normal during normal times before the attack. He used to sit down over here. He could see these people. So early morning, because one odd Pakistani poor chap used to come out from his defences to relieve himself. The moment he used to see this chap, he used to take one gun fire at him. <laughs> Very close to him. This poor chap would, you know, get up and go to another place. He would ask another gun to fire at him. The moment he this fellow would keep chasing this guy. <laughs> so he used to call him a mad at that. He used to tell, I, so I used to tell him, don't talk to that poor chap, let him please. Kill him please. <laughs> to kill him later on, but don't do this torture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but he was a good, good battery commander, a good gunner. So he, I trusted him. So I said, Dehra, do you know where I am? He says, sir, I know exactly where you are. I said, with all your guns, six rounds rapid fire. He had 18 guns, both of us. And 18 guns, six rounds rapid fire means six rounds per gun. And six into 18, 108. 108 rounds, I said, fire on my head. Now, one Bofo round falls somewhere in this area. This complete complex will go. It's so powerful. And here I am asking him to fire 108 rounds on my head. So he thought again, I've gone mad. He says, Sir, please repeat. Are you saying that fire on your head? I said, Yes. Is there any doubt in the English? He says, No, sir. Sir, please affirm, do I fire on your head? I said, Then I used my language. I said, you so and so, don't waste my time and you fire. Then he heard my note with that uh, adjective. He understood that it was me. And then he said, right sir. And then I could hear him giving the order and he said, fire. Now the Pakis are closing to me like this. And they are shouting, Ame malo mein, ab to gola wal maake khatam ho gaya hai, abhi dekho kya karte hai. And they are coming close and close, 20 yards, 15 yards. So I told the boys, now. Just get into the rocks, hide into the rocks, because the shelling is going to come. And rocks also make sure that it is slightly elevated above the ground. Better knowledge, you know. Because if it is too close to the ground or you are flush, you may still get some splinters. See, all of them went into the rocks. Even I went. And the bombs started falling down. The parties were caught right out in the open. They did not know what was coming. I could hear the screech of the shells coming at us. That was the loveliest sound I ever heard. The shells coming at you. And they started falling there. You could see those pieces flying. Literally. The Pagay didn't know what hit them. Three times they did that and three times we got them like that. And by the time, it was already 36 hours. Not a drop of water. Not a morsel of food. Minus 32 degrees. Covered up to here in snow. Wet totally, shaking like grandma's tooth. This was our state. And uh, the Pakis, when they caught the thing, they were totally shattered. And like I told you, sitting down there, I still remember that very, very poignant moment. You know, one of my Johnnies was uh, uh, sitting down slightly that side, and I was here. And of course, the sniper had seen me, and I had a binocular kept over here like this. And he shot at me. Because in my hurry, I had forgotten to take my red tags off. Normally in the war, you take off your ranks and all this. I had no thought for myself. I was with the boys totally. I had not even carried my weapon. I just carried one pistol over here, which is like a pea shooter in actual battle. So this fellow took a shot at me with the binocular here. The bullet went through like this and through, the, through and through the binocular. It saved my life. Wow. I have got the binocular here today. I'll show it to you how the bullets went through and through. So close it was. Then one of my boys was there, I told him, don't move. But he thought he saw some action there and he wanted to make sure that he is observing correctly. Look at the dedication of that chap. He knew that if he gets up, that sniper was so accurate. Later on, we captured his rifle and we saw it was the type of the rifle and the ammunition which they use in Olympics, you know, that precision rifle. Oh. That fellow was really getting our guys with the sniper rifle. So this fellow got up just for a second and tuck, tuck, I could hear the bullet just hitting him. Just that sound, you know, and he fell down. Just, I still remember it was totally white snow over there. This poor chap fell down. And the first reaction of any man who was hit with a bio bullet is, my God, I've been shot, I've been hit. You mean to say I'm going to die? That shock was there in his face. Hey, sir, I mean, 
that shock hadn't gotten, but you know, he was, he, he couldn't uh, digest the fact. And then he just fell down there. He couldn't move. Then that snow which was white in front of him slowly started turning crimson and red. That blood started going, pouring out. And then later on, after about five minutes, he realized that he is not going to make it back. He looked at me with those eyes like this, dull eyes like this. I still remember. And I was hiding behind the rock, firing, hiding behind the rock. Cold, absolutely. He said, Sir, thoda sa pani pila do, sir. He was getting thirsty. He said, thoda sa pani pila do, sir. I didn't have, I couldn't even get up to give him water. If the moment I get up, he's going to blast my head off. So I said, okay, I said, you can move a little. And I crumpled some ice like this, made it into a ball, and I tried to throw it in his mouth. Once, twice, three times, and he would open his mouth slightly, open like that. The fifth ball I threw, he was dead. I mean, I, that's, these sort of things I can never forget. I, I still keep getting haunted by these dreams, you know. My young boys, I still feel very bad for them. <coughs> anyway, so that is how we spent our 36 hours over here. And by the time the last attack was blasted off by the artillery fire, my reinforcements came up under my second in command over here from this side. And this whole area was captured. After this area was captured, it was a virtual route of the enemy. Everywhere we went, we only found ropes hanging where they had just slithered down the rope and run for their lives. We came down from here, captured these areas complete. These complete areas, we decimated a lot of them. Came here, went further up to take the point five nine zero zero and all these the, the areas over here, and right up to the watershed. Within a month, we have cleared everyone. 11 formidable peaks we have captured during this war. That is why, besides the other gallantry awards and other things which are there, the major thing that we achieved here was a Paramgir Chakra, which Manoj Kumar Pandey got on my recommendations, and the battalion, besides getting the unit chief's unit citation, has also been christened by the chief and the president as the bravest of the brave for its actions. I wish you all the best. I wanted to deliberately make it short because I also got some engagements coming up. I could have carried on for a longer time. But suffice to say, it was great having shared this uh, moment with you. I wish you all the best. And uh, to reflect what my soldiers have sacrificed and what they would be saying, I will quote to you an epitaph written on a tombstone in the uh, cemetery or the graveyard at Kohima. This is a graveyard which they made for the soldiers who laid their lives down in the Second World War in Kohima, Nagaland. The epitaph which is there, it says, when you go home, tell them of us and say, when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. Wow. I have got with me a bullet and uh, the binocular which was shot went through. I will show it to you. You have a look. The normal bullet size is, you know, you take a small finger and just put a finger like this. This is the size of a normal bullet. Even this is a bigger bullet, you can say. But the bullet that they fired at us, So the 50 cal bullet. Remember, just two grams of explosive is enough to kill a man. With this sort of a thing, it can shatter you. I have neutralized this. I have kept this like this so that you know. This can shatter you. It just makes a big hole and then carries a five or six cases of meat off from the back. I have seen that happening. This blows you apart. And the binocular which I have here is this. When I was wearing it like this, and the bullet came like this, you can see the bullet hole, and went out like this. Spun out like this. This was the type of closeness with which we went here. Because I was shot in the leg, and splinters on the leg, 
and uh, they, they kept telling me, come down, come down, you have done your job. But I said, no, if I come down now, the whole thing will collapse. The operation would have gone for a six. So I held on for uh, 36 hours with all this bleeding and pain and the other trauma that was going on. But it paid off well. Thank you, I leave this, you can have a look. Well, that man definitely has some great stories and it would be interesting to hear some more of his stories. But what I think is great is the fact that just a couple of years after the war ended, I think this was 2003, 2004 maybe, he actually went and told a story to those people. And they got it on video, which I think is great. Any time that you can preserve history like that, I think is so important, especially when it comes to war. Because people need to know what war really is about, what soldiers actually go through on the battlefield. That way they can understand that they are sacrificing their lives for their country and that they should be grateful. One of the many good things about India is that they are very appreciative of their soldiers and all the citizens do realize the sacrifice that their soldiers go through to make their country safe. Anyway, great recommendation. Thank you so much. If you got any value from this video, it would help me out a lot. If you would like, share, comment, hit the thanks button, subscribe, or just watch some more videos. Thanks for watching.